hi everyone uh, my name is kumar kartik devedi and today i'll present the work we uh, sort of did with my colleague rishabh and my advisor sanidhya in the past year on making bps more flexible while retaining its two main advantages its low overhead of execution and its flexible nature so let's get started so uh, if you might know kernel extensions allow us to safely uh, customize an operating system on the fly uh, we all know bps is widely used for a lot of use cases from observability networking security uh, cpu scheduling and so on uh, what you might not be aware of is that this whole area is also very well explored in academia so a lot of work and a lot of adops were explored back in the 90s on research operating systems and it sort of back academic circles again because bps is now being actively used and very popular just before we begin uh, some uh, terms that we'll keep referring to so kernel interfaces uh, are basically how people define like uh, how extensions interact with the kernel so in the bps land we uh, know about helper functions we know about pointers and pointers to kernel objects and then we have like well defined hooks inside the kernel where you can place your extension uh, and whatever kernel safety rules are defined for ex extensions they are defined with respect to these kernel interfaces so how you interact with them and how you use the resources the kernel makes available for you so if we had a ideal kernel extension framework it would like we can boil down uh, the four target properties that it would uh, provide us with first would be a baseline guarantee of safety so you can do no harm to the kernel and like you use the kernel interfaces in a correct manner the second one is the ability to express a diverse functionality inside your extension so you should be able to do quote unquote arbitrary stuff as long as you don't uh, harm cause harm to the kernel third is performance like ideally you want the lowest amount of overhead when you are executing your extension and finally Criticality. We refer to uh, refer to it as a requirement where you don't have to learn a specific programming language. Uh, you can just compile down to a common instruction set and basically uh, like uh, depend on the depend on the runtime to uh, run your extension. So coming on to the problem statement, uh, when we navigate all of these properties, uh, what we observe today is that kernel extensibility is either flexible or it is performant, but it, it is not both at the same time. so for example we can possibly allow near arbitrary code when the kernel extension is uploaded inside the kernel and rely on runtime checks to ensure safety but this would involve a lot of high overhead because you would need a mem sanitization of memory accesses checking like random function calls that are happening all over the place the second way which is what bps sort of does is basically constrain the extension logic try to verify all the paths and what this means is that we don't need a lot of runtime checks so we can sort of compile down the bytecode to native machine instructions directly and all of these existing approaches even back in academia and with ebp are sort of hitting their limits because they either trade flexibility for performance or performance for flexibility and all of these approaches sort of take a certain technique and try to use it to enforce kernel safety uh, throughout the extension so we'll look at three examples and we'll start with spin so spin is, uh, was a research operating system back in the 90s this is like sort of one of the first uh, operating systems that popularized the use of extensions and in this case they basically wrote their extensions in modular c which is like no longer in use along with spin and kernel safety was done through type safety as long as the program compiles and it's type safe like it, it should uh, adhere to the rules of the kernel uh, safety as well and the sort of stuck with a specific language if you want to write extensions you have to write them in modular c if you want to access memory of the kernel or some other extension you have to go through these specified helper accessor calls uh, which are which is what they call them and like uh, the amount of logic you can expect is limited to the language now if you look at the kernel interface that spin exposes to the user it sort of looks similar to what we see with bps uh, we have like well defined procedure with a well defined input and your kernel extensions can come in and hook there and perform a specific like uh, isolated action 
and the subsystem exposes a lot of hooks and allows you to like sort of manipulate uh, its behavior. The second example is Vino. So this is in stark contrast to Spin. Uh, so Vino sort of uh, took arbitrary C++ code from the user, relied on sandboxing or, uh, or uh, it's also called software port isolation. So basically uh, oversimplifying all function calls, all memory accesses, they sort of need to be runtime checked. And uh, it also supported this notion of helper functions uh, called accessors, and they, they were mostly similar to EPPS, but like the checking happened at runtime. What is interesting though is that they analyzed a lot of misbehaviors. So suppose if your extension gets stuck inside the kernel, like what do you do then? So they had this uh, notion of abort or termination semantics. So suppose if you take a kernel log, you need to uh, release the log before you abort the extension. You cannot keep the log, abort the extension, and return back to the kernel. So what they did was keep a buffer alongside the extension. Every time you acquired a ref count or a kernel log, you would just switch to this buffer. And then if the extension was aborted, this buffer would be looked up, called the undo log. And then we walk through this undo log and release all of the kernel resources that are possibly acquired. And we look at what Vino exposed to the user, sort of trained and very well defined. Like you have your uh, HTTP server extension which operates on a file. You can sort of read and write that that's what Vino allowed. But overall, like it's still constrained, it's still well defined with a narrow interface uh, for, for the extension to hook into. Uh, this is sort of over, oversimplifying what DPF does, but in comparison to both of these two, uh, different in the way that you don't have a dependence on a specific language, you compile down to bytecode. So we already have like two front ends uh, in C and Rust. Uh, the verifier does static verification, symbolically executes the bytecode, explodes all the path of the program, all the path of the program. We have helper functions and trusted uh, like pointers to kernel objects to, to basically access and uh, manipulate like kernel uh, data. We sort of have maps, and we also have uh, native data structures now, which basically are exposed to helpers that allow you to like manage your own data structures. Flexibility in the program is sort of bound by what the static verification theory can support. So, like in the past, there used to be no loops. Then we went to bounded loops. As the verifier got smarter, we went to BPF, this BPF loop helper, and then now to BPF iterators. Uh, one, uh, one similarity to Vino is that uh, when you acquire a kernel resource, you basically have the verifier forces you to release it before you exit the extension. So right now, there's no way to abort an extension. You just uh, do it manually on your own. And it looks pretty similar to the other two examples that we saw. In this particular case, we have a, this is select. So we have like a, a select CPU callback. And this is the BPS box interface, like a table of function pointers. Inside the extension, like you get access to this path struct and a few arguments, and you can call helpers and perform a specific action. So one observation out of looking at, back at these uh, academic uh, extension frameworks is that kernel interfaces have always been well defined and narrow because, like, the kernel has certain invariants. You want to limit the scope of what the extension can do, so you have a constrained access to helpers, constrained access to kernel objects, and you can only operate on a specific uh, event or object at a time. And the flexibility in extensions is mostly about behavior that probably does not uh, uh, deal directly with kernel interfaces. So one example is like how much time I spend inside my extension. And uh, the other would be like, how am I managing my own memory? So regardless of what happens with kernel memory, how am I keeping my own state, like my own linked list, arbitrary, or whatever? Post verification is sort of uh, tractable for the first case, but uh, as we've seen with DPS as well, we, we sort of have added these linked lists, arbitraries to do native data structures. It, it sort of hits, hits its limits when you do like bespoke data structures inside your program. So, like the project, we uh, name it KFlex, but it's basically uh, a, lo uh, um, uh, a lot of components that basically we, uh, some, some of them are upstream and some of them, like, uh, I hope uh, we can, like, contribute them back. So, the idea here is that we split uh, safety properties on a philosophical level into two categories. 
the first is kernel interface compliance, which is about like how you access kernel resources, the kernel interfaces. The second is about extension correctness, which is mostly about whether the extension terminates in time and how it accesses its own memory. Once you separate these two, uh, the idea is to separate what mechanism you use to like enforce safety for either case. So as we saw before, static verification is, is sort of tractable for the first case. So we retain that, we retain eBPF behavior. For the second case, we rely on runtime sandboxing and cancellation, which are like we know the board for extension memory and like ensuring that the extension terminates. And one easy uh, observation, like uh, once you dig deeper into this separation, is that it's tied to the ownership of resources. So kernel memory and objects that lie under kernel interface compliance are basically owned by the kernel. So it's giving you access to these narrow interfaces, to these helper calls, to these pointers, where you can access specific fields. Extension memory is its own big, maybe map data, maybe its own English, where the extension manages, manages the lifetime of it and like does its own manipulation. CPU on a logical level is also owned by the extension, but the fine print is that in, in reality, the kernel is still sort of leasing the CPU out to the extension for a given time quantum and expects it back. But for, from the perspective of the extension, the CPU is sort of owned by it. So to perform this sort of safety split, uh, the first thing we add is uh, a heap map, which is the same thing as an arena map, but it supports uh, sizes greater than four gigabytes. Uh, arena maps, if you don't know, basically uh, went in uh, around January this year, and uh, they, they basically have a sparse region of memory for extensions. And uh, you can allocate and deallocate pages within this within this sparse region, and they're surrounded by guard pages, uh, which we'll see why 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 that's important. Since we support greater than four gigabytes, uh, SFI or sandboxing scheme is sort of a uh, little bit different as well. Arenas rely on 32-bit uh, instruct like operations to basically clear off the top uh, 32 bits, so they sort of constrain to four gigabytes. But since we support more than that, we have to do something different. We'll talk about uh, what we do. Uh, so uh, we place a constraint on uh, the allocation of heaps. Uh, so I'll say heaps, arena. The, uh, we'll use these. Uh, we'll use this term interchangeably. And heaps are allocated in the virtual address space uh, without physical pages backing them initially. And we force that alignment is equal to size. So why do we do this? Uh, that makes the cost of our SFI like much much lower because if alignment of the heap is equal to its size, then the lower bit of the heap's base address that you see uh, in this particular case, OHZ000, will be zero because it's a power of two. And this sort of possibly wastes some virtual address space, but that is cheap. Suppose, suppose you ask for like uh, 15 gigabytes, it bumps the size to 16 gigabytes, but you don't really allocate physical memory for it. So it's just more page table entries, I believe. And we sort of rely on the verifiers, data flow analysis, use its range tracking information, type plate numbers to basically reduce guard emissions where possible. If we see that the pointer is safe to access, we don't uh, do this guard emission. For x86, we sort of reserve two registers for this purpose, two registers which are unused by the JIT. So Artfell stores the base address of the heap. This is the same as Arena's. Arena's uh, have, have this as well. Then R9 stores the heap mask, which we need every time we do the hand instruction. Otherwise, we would have to like load the immediate uh, every time and then do the hand instruction. So it becomes much cheaper. Uh, it becomes a single instruction guard. And all accesses happen using this base index displacement encoding in x86. It's similar to Arena's. The, this is the same way Arena's does, Arena does its uh, accesses. So Arena do translation as well, but since our SFI scheme is different, uh, we'll have to do translations differently. Uh, why do we need translations? Arenas or heaps, they can be mapped in user space, and pointers that escape into them need to be translated if user space is trying to access them from this, from the, from at the same simultaneously. So if you have two, uh, like a user space thread that is walking a link list together with you, then you need uh, the pointers to be translated so that it can uh, do valid accesses in its address space. So if 
translate from kernel to user, we have we have a four instruction sequence. We move the user base immediate into a register, call it with a with the destination, and then we translate and we then we see move. Why do we need a test? Because we need to preserve nullness. If we don't do a test, then basically we'll convert null pointers and we'll translate them to the base address of the user space. And this is where the verifier comes in handy. So if we ever observe that the pointer has been null checked, which is quite common, like once you load pointers uh, that are shared in some data structure, you often do null check. Uh, we can actually skip this sequence and just uh, like reduce it down to two instructions. The nice thing about uh, translation here is that since we uh, since we rely that user space, we don't rely on user space. It will just be incorrect if user space does not do it. But we hope, uh, like in libdcs, we sort of do that. Uh, we we align uh, we map the heap in user space at an aligned address as well, similar to how we do it inside the kernel. So both inside the user space and the kernel, the upper bits are different, but the lower bits are shared. Then, like when once we need to translate from user to kernel, it becomes like a simple guard instruction that we saw in the previous slide. It becomes a, a single AND instruction. Right. So this was about uh, managing the extensions on memory. And next, uh, our cancellation. So last year at MCC, I sort of talked about how uh, I did resource cleanup for uh, extensions. Uh, that still hasn't landed. Like I hope to land it soon. But uh, basically, like if you didn't follow it last time, the idea is that an extension may have multiple cancellation cancellation points. So suppose if you're accessing a page not present in the arena, and then for each cancellation point, you'll build a table of acquired kernel resources. This is the main uh, this is the main thing that we need to do when, when once we cancel an extension. We need to release the resources it, it has acquired. When the extension is cancelled, we look up this table and basically go entry by entry and release all of the kernel resources. So what do we do with non-terminating loops? Non-terminating loops, uh, iterators sort of su uh, support uh, this BCS repeat, BCS uh, for matter. So you can logically write a loop with 8 million iterations, which acts like a non-terminating loop. But it, but it is much uh, like uh, simpler to express like a while, uh, a while loop iterating over the link list like you do in normal C. So for this purpose, whenever we see these loops where we cannot ensure termination, we instrument the backend with this terminate instruction like load uh, sampling. So what this does is basically load a benign address. It's, it's a valid address most of the time. And uh, this is basically stored somewhere inside the orgs uh, of, uh, of the BPS program. And whenever we want to uh, Terminate such loops. We just uh, reset this terminate add, uh, address uh, variable to null. So when the load instruction happens the next time inside the extension, if it is stuck and it is it keeps looping, it, has, it will always go through this instrumented back edge. Then basically it uh, does a page fault. And since this uh, instrumented back edge is marked as a cancellation point, this all in turn triggers cancellation. So right now this affects extensions on all CPUs, but this is orthogonal to the cancellation cancellation mechanism. Uh, this is a policy decision because like uh, if an extension is misbehaving, if it's stuck, it probably it probably makes more sense to kill it and like remove it from the system. But like uh, if it makes sense as feature work, we can also isolate it uh, to a single CPU and like let ex the same extension running on other CPUs be unaffected. So uh, an example. So in this particular case, uh, this is like a dumbed down example. But if we uh, allocate a socket, if we do a socket lookup, we are sort of acquiring a rest count on the socket. Then we do this KFlex pen lock, which is just an NCS lock implementation inside BPS itself. So it's like a spin loop. You can imagine it. Imagine it as a spin loop over the lock. Then we do this uh, while node no, is not equal to null. We try to search for the key in the list, and then we keep iterating over the list. Then we unlock and release the kernel resource. So in this in, in this example, we have four cancellation points. Two, three, and four uh, appear to be uh, obvious. Two and three are heap accesses. This link list is on a heap or an arena. So basically, like every time you access it, uh, it's possible the page may not be present. So we need to handle that event. The back edge the Floating brace is also a cancellation point because terminate instruction will be sampling the, 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 the access there. And KFlex pin lock also has a cancellation point because it's 
having a possibly non-terminating loop inside when it's running on the log. And for all of these, the object table will look the same. Uh, it would be the SK variable, and it would store the release handler for this and like consult it at one time. So how is recovery done? Like uh, we rely on the soft lockup and hard lockup watchdog, like the NMI watchdog uh, detection logic, and basically uh, the granularity of this is in seconds. By default, it's set to set to five seconds or ten seconds. Uh, it can sort of be uh, reduced down to one second, but then you have like these uh, interrupts firing more often. Uh, if an extension is hung on a CPU, uh, we basically rely on them to see whether it's not making progress and cancel it. Uh, again, as we, saw, as we saw before, we just set this terminate address bit to null. This uh, terminate sampled access will then basically uh, cause a phase fault, and this will, this will then trigger a cancellation. And we would know that uh, all of the lockups that could be caused inside in, uh, inside extensions would be due to these un possibly non-terminating loops, which have this terminate uh, sampling. So that was about termination. Uh, the third thing that we did was uh, trying to basically put uh, the boundaries a little bit and to co-design like extensions with use case applications. So uh, the two examples we'll talk about later uh, basically hold logs from both the extension side and the user space side, and this is a spin log. Uh, we need translation because both sides will uh, be accessing pointers. We added this, uh, we preempt enable disable to like control uh, preemption for, for, for these cases. And uh, an NCS log implementation within BPF itself, so we don't need any extra kernel support for this. But there's a problem. The user space side may not really uh, like be guaranteed to make progress because the kernel can preempt it. So what we do right now is basically uh, set a bit in the restartable sequences region, which is basically a shared memory region with the scheduler. When the timer tick happens and the scheduler notices that it's time to preempt this thread, it will check this bit. And if this bit is set, it basically gives it a one-time uh, extension of a considerable time quantum. Uh, in our experiment, 50 to 100 microseconds was enough, but it might uh, it might need to be more. Uh, and and uh, this is how we avoid the problem where a user space thread is holding the log, extensions are waiting for it, and then this user space thread goes away, and then extensions are not able to make progress. Uh, there are two things that can go wrong. Uh, if you don't uh, finish the critical section in that extension, you will be forcefully preempted out. So maybe the user space is uh, hung or user space is killed or user space is preempted out. What happens then? In this particular case, extensions will possibly keep waiting and then uh, spinning and eventually they will hit the translation, uh, watchdog driven cancellation because they would uh, end up spinning for too long inside the kernel. So what happens if user space corrupts the log? Well, random memory corruption occurs. Anything, anything can happen. Like you can act, like possibly have multiple owners going at the same time. But this is not impacting kernel safety. All, all damage that happens remains contained to the extension. So we sort of use this to dock suit and implement our own memory allocator. So what we do right now is basically uh, map arena heaps in user space. And JMalloc supports uh, replacing its uh, MMAP backend with a custom uh, memory region. So we use uh, the JMalloc arenas to basically replace them with replace them with heaps. Uh, the user space thread basically uh, pre uh, like prepares a per CPU cache and uh, keeps refilling it for the extension when uh, memory reserves run low. And from the extension side, we use ring buffers to basically tell the thread to wake up when we are running low on memory. So the benefit is that the extension side memory allocator is pretty simple. We don't have to do a lot of complicated logic. And we have a per CPU cache and then a shared pool, which is like uh, filled, refilled with user space. We draw elements from the shared pool and we feed elements back based on a watermark. And all fragmentation, all the tricky uh, memory related utilization logic is basically handled by the JMalloc backend. The downside is, is that if, if you're not careful, then basically uh, when your user space thread gets killed, then basically you don't have anything to like uh, continue your memory allocation. So sort of your extension uh, hits the out of memory condition once it, it has allocated enough stuff. Finally, there's one uh, optimization that's seen to help a lot. 
uh, and this was basically eliding guard whenever we read memory. So uh, if, if, we, if we don't emit guards uh, when we read memory, we'll sort of allowing the kernel to uh, allow the extension to read random kernel addresses. But this is sort of already possible with probe read semantics and DTS for privileged ex extensions. And this trades off confidentiality for performance, like we uh, eliminate a lot of guard instructions as long as you're not writing to that pointer. If you're trying to read user addresses, uh, a snap is usually enabled in the kernel, so you'll uh, basically hit the supervisor, uh, like page fault, and then basically your extension will be cancelled. So now we go over evals. So what we did with this uh, was implementing a small version of memcached in the XDP hook. And the thing, the two examples we evaluated it against was the user space memcached and uh, BMC, which is a look aside cache for get requests, so it does not handle sets. So as you see, when the ratio uh, of gets is high, BMC sort of performs pretty well, but as the number of sets start increasing, the performance becomes mostly equivalent or worse than the user space memcached because it has it has extra traversals, extra lookups inside the kernel uh, with BMC enabled. And overall, we see that it, you can get up to 3x more throughput than BMC and user space memcached, and around like say it, anywhere from 2x to 9x reduction in your P99 latency. And this is this is a kind that is uh, serving like sending uh, traffic in a closed loop uh, situation. So it's it's not really. Uh, the, the maximum you can get. If you had an open loop scenario, you would pro possibly see like, uh, more uh, performance benefit. The second thing that we did was uh, memcached in XDP, but protecting still entries uh, in the hash tables from user space. So this is like the user space extension co design. Uh, user space accesses the hash table buckets, has introduced some contention with the memcached running in XDP. So in this particular case, uh, the improvement drops compared to uh, user space and the latency improvement drops as well in P99. But that's mostly because we see more contention now. Every second the thread wakes up, tries to walk over the list and basically like edit elements out. The uh, third thing that we did was Reddit uh, in SKSKB. Uh, we chose SKSKB because like just, just to like try out different hooks and uh, show that basically it can, it can work uh, pretty much anywhere. Uh, in this particular case, the benefits are lower because like it goes through the kernel networking stack up until the socket layer. So you can get around 2x more throughput uh, up to 3x uh, lower P99. And if you have, uh, we, we also did Z add requests. So these are pretty interesting because unlike sets and gets, which are like a hash table lookup or hash table update, the Z ads require you to maintain a hash table of lists inside. So basically, you have to, every time you add an element to uh, using Z add, you first do a hash, hash map update, then you allocate a skip list, and then you put the skip list inside this hash map. So it's it's like it's uh, sort of uh, like scripting the the whole uh, heap uh, mechanism a lot. And in this particular case, we see that we get around 1.6x more throughput than user space, uh, like around 30% reduction in P99. The more interesting stuff is uh, these data structure offloads. So we did five. Uh, sketches are sort of very simple, so I'll ignore them in this, uh, this session. But we did hash map, RV3, link list, skip list. So, and, and uh, KFlex PM is basically performance mode enabled. KFlex uh, without PM is basically like uh, without performance mode. And KMod is basically a kernel, unsafe kernel implementation, which the VPA program can call through a helper. So what we observe is that we have around 7% throughput overhead compared to the in-kernel implementation. I'll get into the reasons for that. And around 20% uh, uh, latency uh, increase again, compared against the kernel implementation, and a maximum of like 80% uh, throughput overhead. Like that mostly occurs in case of split, which is like uh, doing more dynamic stuff with more dynamic variables, so it's much harder to reduce guard emissions. So the final thing in EVAD was basically uh, figuring out whether verification, uh, the, the, the state that the verifier maintains helps the SFI. And we sort of uh, saw that in these data structures, 
So you cannot remove the guards that uh, you emit on unknown pointers. If you load some uh, the pointers from a random place, you need to guard it. But if you're doing pointer manipulations, uh, you can sort of uh, remove these guards if you know that they still uh, are within the bounds of the heap or arena. If you're sort of uh, straddling over the guard page, it's still fine to allow it. So what we see is that on average, like 75% of these guards on pointer manipulation, you can just get rid of by noticing the value in either the offset, the constant offset that's used, or like known bits in the var of tenum. And like surprisingly for the stateless case, there was uh, there's, there's, like the var of tenum stuff actually reduced uh, the guard emissions a lot. So before ending this, a wish list of things that might make sense uh, for uh, like uh, arena of free encapsulations and everything. So we sort of uh, thought about doing sandboxing using protection keys, uh, ignoring that PKS appears to be dead. But there's a way to like use uh, PKU with uh, the UB set on arena pages. But the cost here is that you have this uh, fixed 30 to 50 nanosecond cost when you switch the protection key mode. So this only makes sense if you have BPS global functions or like specific BPS uh, like functions which only do heap accesses. Like they don't touch the kernel stuff at all. So it would make a lot of sense in that case. And we can completely remove SFI overhead uh, for, for those particular subroutines. So this is something that uh, it seems worth exploring. The, the, the other thing that I talked about, data structure, the other source of overhead seemed to be that uh, there's some register threshold, like uh, the code is sort of different between what the kernel uh, produces when GCC compiles it versus what gets created. Uh, like we, we sort of uh, reserve two registers as well, so that doesn't help. Uh, it would be nice to have more registers in BPS, uh, maybe because we do this uh, for this to arm, it might not fall as well. Uh, mixing kernel and arena objects. So this is about uh, basically storing pointers to trusted kernel objects inside arenas. This appears to be a lot harder than I initially thought, because if you read something from the arena, you you can basically not trust it at all. So maybe we, we can use indirect references, something like a file descriptor table like we have in user space, where they use indices to refer to the actual kernel object, uh, but, but this might introduce scalability issues. So this is something to explore. And the final thing is like more uh, flexible locking, uh, uh, like along three fronts. So right now we use MCS locks, which are like good, but uh, like the kubespin log implementation is better. So that would make a lot of sense to use. The current MCS locks are not portable. We rely on the x86 JIT doing the right thing. So because there's no memory model for BPS yet. And when deadlocks happen, we sort of basically kill the extension. So there's no way for you to possibly recover from that sort of state. So this is something I'm working on right now. And hopefully like uh, this will, uh, this will uh, work out. And we also have a paper on this, so for more details, uh, check out this link, but maybe in a couple of days because we're still working on the final version. I'll take questions now. Thank you very much. We protect against invalid memory accesses, but is there any way for you to protect against uh, memory leaks? So if my extension leaks memory, I can in the system, right? Uh, so basically, like, from the perspective of the kernel, the extension is just allocating pages within this heap. So like that, that those pages that you allocate within the heap, they get charged against this key group or whatever was used to create the arena map, uh, basically. So, so when, when you allocate those pages, you would hit the limit right then, basically. But once you allocate the page in the heap, you do the chunking of them into smaller objects later on in the memory allocator. So you would uh, hit the ON condition much earlier if you uh, try to basically uh, use up your memory. And capacity. then my extension gets cancelled. Uh, yes. Random process. Uh, so the extension doesn't get cancelled. It's just the page allocation will fail. So you have the memory you have, and you cannot allocate more. Just like you, it happens in user space. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Please comments. <laughs>
does the GPS side memory allocation work? So like you, you have like pre-allocated bunch of memory and just check it? Uh, so so the, the way it works for the console, right? the reason I'm asking because for, for Arena, right, like to allocate new memory, you need to be in sleep or both. Like even you are in XD, so like mm -hmm. the bus, you can do that, right? So like you just check that, right? Yeah. Yes. The space knows when to. Yeah, so there's a, there's a background thread, uh, basically, for each extension, and uh, you have a per CPU pool for the extension, so those are already pre-allocated and uh, in, in slab classes. And once you hit a low watermark, it, uh, you have to sort of have enough headroom so that user space wakes up and basically re refills your shared pool. So per CPU cache is then a shared pool, which is long. User space can also fill in entries there. And you use the ring buffer to basically send a notification to user space. From the other side, it will actually do the allocations. Since it is in task context, it can do its feasible stuff. And then malloc is used to basically convert those big pages into like smaller objects. You, you still can run out of memory, right? Like what will happen in that case? You have to check it? On the, on the extension side, yeah. If you, if you basically run out of memory, then yeah. You would probably fail the updates, but maybe not the gets because you just have to look up the hash table. You don't have to add entries into the hash table. Okay. Well, I think we need to take the remaining questions into the hallway. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.